Welcome back to the Clean My Space channel. We're here at the Clean My Space headquarters in my basement where we probably have 27 plants. And standing beside me is a longtime friend of ours and the channels. This is Daryl from Houseplant Journal. Hey everyone. Daryl, what do you have going on online? I have my website, houseplantjournal.com and Instagram, Houseplant Journal, as well YouTube channel, Houseplant Journal. And basically Daryl's job is to teach all of us how to keep our plants alive and more importantly, how not to kill them. And you've done a great job teaching Chad and I how to do that. And we have a thriving plant environment here in the house, thanks to you. Also, we have some dead ones and we're gonna talk about that in this video. So come along, we're gonna learn some do's and don'ts, but most importantly, how to keep your plants alive. Daryl, the first thing that kills plants is water. Too much or too little? So help us understand what's going on. So quite often we, we think about like, how often do I have to water this plant? As if it was something specific to every plant. So it's not like just water all these plants every Tuesday? N no, definitely not. And that's probably the reason why they die. I think the better approach to watering plants is to simply observe the soil dryness. And really, if you think about it, there's only three different ways to observe this dryness. So the first type here, let's call it uh, water when completely dry, all of your cacti and your succulents. You check the soil. If the soil is still even slightly wet, it's not time to water yet. Oh gosh, Daryl, like, you're not going to be happy with this. You're sitting in a pool of water. Oh dear. Okay. My friends, this is the exact not way to water a cactus. Well, this will kill it. It's good that we caught it now because you can now empty this water and then let it collect more light and then it'll be okay. Right, because a cactus doesn't need a lot of water and we know that about this plant. So I think a really important thing to note here is get to know your plants and their needs so that you can understand how much water they need so that you don't kill them by overwatering them, which we have a perfect example for right here. So, so with cacti, it's, it's that not that you don't need a lot, but it's rather, it's not very frequent, right? I think I have a cactus injury. All good, go on. And then so, one thing that can also help you here is the thickness of the leaves. So a leaf that's really thick like this uh, zigzag cactus, you can, well, I mean, it's called a cactus, but you can just fe feel how much these leaves are thick and therefore full of water, meaning it's a clue that says it doesn't need to be watered all that often. Whereas a really thin leaf plant like this philodendron here, or even this dracaena, it's a clue that says it could require water a little sooner. So for these types of plants, I would wait until the soil is only about halfway dry. Right. So you water it, wait, 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 wait until it's about halfway dry and then time to water again. Yeah, and you just kind of keep an eye on the soil to tell that. But then as you say, with the thicker plants like this, it's almost like skincare where they say if you if you pull your skin on your hand and it stays up, then it tells you that oh, you're dehydrated. I, I did not know that. Yeah, so it's the same thing with the plant. Very good tip. So don't overwater, don't underwater. Goldilocks water. Right. And, and so that I, I just mentioned like the first type of watering, which is water when completely dry, water when partially dry. The last type is keep the soil evenly moist. And there are types of plants that do that. For example, uh, calatheas or begonias or uh, maidenhair fern is a perfect example of a plant where right when you water, it's heavy with water, uh, but then it could be one or two days later, it starts to feel light again. It's time to water again. And again, it just comes down to knowing your plants. So that's for more advanced plant people such as yourself, but for basic plant people such as myself, well, I'd say I'm more, I'm like more intermediate at this point, but when I started with you and I was killing everything, you basically told me to start with the easy plants, learn how to water, learn how to understand the soil, and then you can kind of build up from there and get the more complicated stuff. That's right. <laughs> okay, so too much or too little water can kill a plant too much or too little light can kill a plant. Mm -hmm. So quite often when we talk about light, we hear the term bright indirect light. And as an engineer, something so vague just really hurt my heart. Yeah, and as someone who's not an engineer, what does that even mean? So that's where I decided I would start to measure my indirect light. And I discovered that light levels can change so much, even if you're uh, just a few feet farther from the window. And that's when I realized that most people were hearing this term bright indirect light and thinking, okay, so I should avoid the sun because it's this indirect, but then they put their plants way too far from the window. And that's where this comes in. Exactly. So once you have a light meter, then you have a number that tells you if your indirect light is in fact bright enough. So for example, I can say, you know, make sure your pothos 
which is quote unquote low light tolerant, gets more than let's say 100 foot candles on average each day. Then if you take a light meter and go to your dark corner and realize, oh, it's only 20 here. It's something concrete that you can then make a, a confident decision that says, I shouldn't put my pothos over there. I should put it maybe over here where I read the light to be 200 or 400 foot candles. And by the way, a foot candle is not a romantic thing. It's actually a form of measurement, like an ounce or a decibel for the amount of light um, that your plant is seeing. I mean, that's a very overly simple way to say that, but- No, that, that is exactly conceptually what it is. And yeah. more specifically, it's calibrated to the brightness of one candle on a surface area of one square foot, one foot away. Now, if your plant gets too much light, what happens to the plant? So the, the idea of too much light when we're talking about house plants has to do with too long a duration of direct sun. So when we talk about indirect light, there's never too much indirect light. It's only when the sun starts to shine on it. Now we care about how long is that going to be. Now for most of these plants that I'm looking around here, two or three hours, they should be okay as long as you keep up with watering. Yeah. Once you get beyond three or four hours, then you might start to see leaves uh, fading or scorching a little bit. Yeah. And so after like, I think I would say a week of that, then you might start to notice this. And if that's the case, then I would either pull it back from the window or ideally is to block it with a white sheer curtain so that the sun, the direct sun gets diffused and spread out of it. Yeah, and that's when you redecorate your house for all your plants. So we know what happens if you get too much light. What happens if you get too little light? So with too little light, it's an interesting uh, thing that has to do with watering is that uh, I believe that the whole idea that over watering kills plants is really more that the plant just doesn't get enough light to use up the water that you yeah. just gave it. So let's say you put a plant in a dark corner and you, you know, gave it a nice uh, watering, then the soil, because it's not, you know, working or using up that water, it stays wet for a long time. And that's what promotes what's called root rot. And that's what people are normally, I guess, saying is over watering. But really, it's not that there's too much water. It's that the, the soil stayed too wet for too long. Hmm. So if you want to learn more about Daryl's amazingly designed light meter or how much light a particular plant requires, he's got a fulsome list on his website that you can check out at houseplantjournal.com. And you can also check out his watering can, I have two of them, and this beautiful lighthouse meter. Without sounding too much like the 10 plagues, uh, Daryl, we know that too much or too little water can kill a plant, too much or too little light can kill a plant. But there are also pests and diseases that can kill plants. I'm dealing with that in a couple places right now upstairs, um, which we talked about ahead of shooting this. We can get into that in a moment. But tell us a little bit about what goes on with the pests. So the thing is, uh, we live with plants, but naturally in the wild, we live with also a lot of insects. And there are some insects who love to eat plants. And so with house plants, there are several typical pests that we may find. And the, I guess the difficult thing is that when we buy them, when we initially look at the plant, we might not see them, but they're kind of like hitchhikers. They, their eggs and stuff are kind of sometimes on the plant itself and they don't uh, become visible until maybe a few weeks later. And then you start to notice uh, sometimes browning tips or like faded yellowing patches on the leaf. One, one helpful I thing- I feel judged. <laughs> one helpful thing to realize uh, to sort of tell the difference between uh, just a regular disease or a particular pest is if there's um, patchy discolorations, like irregular on the plant, not the whole thing uh, changing color. So with pests, they like to feast on the leaves and it's important to be able to spot the sort of uh, discolorations early on so that you can uh, take care of them as soon as possible. So what do you do? You go up with like a magnifying glass and you look at the leaf and you kind of look for spidery Yes, so the pests can be very small. I, I can still see them without a magnifying glass. Uh, and uh, there's different different types of pests have different, I guess, telltale signs. So you just mentioned spidery. There's one called spider mite, which is a very tiny arachnid. And the telltale sign is you start to see fine webbing mm. on the leaves or mm. also little like pinprick damage on the leaf. Okay. Yeah. I think, yeah, and another thing you told me one time was to blow on the leaf and if dust scattered off and it was just dust, but if it was like a kind of a sticky powder, then that was... That's also spider mites, yes. Yeah. So 
you mentioned that if, if, if you see little uh, white, I guess, uh, lo what looks like dust on the back of a plant, then if you blow on them and they, they stick to the plant, then it's also most likely spider mite because those are actually the spider mite uh, shells when they do go through metamorphosis. Delicious. <laughs> Delicious. So yeah, there are a number of different diseases that your plants can get. Typically they come from bugs. Um, and you had told me to do a wash on the leaves and you said it was water and Castile soap. Yes, so you can use water and Castile soap, which is a, so as opposed to a detergent soap, right. uh, Castile soap is, is gentler and won't uh, ruin the waxy coating of your leaves. And that's a good kind of regular maintenance thing to do, even just to help you regularly inspect all sides of, of your leaves. Yeah, and it's funny, I didn't even think about dusting the plants off, but you had mentioned that if your plants get dusty, they can't properly photosynthesize. So obviously I use a maker's clean microfiber cloth to clean off my plant leaves every now and then. I got lots of other things to clean too, but every now and then I will do that. And it, it's true, it does give you a good opportunity to inspect for any of that. And it's at that point where I go in house plant journal and I'm like, what am I seeing here and what do I do? Mm -hmm. And so if you do happen to see like uh, a particular pest, then the first thing that I try to do is physically remove the pest. So. Uh, Masking tape or even a, like a tape-based lint roller is really good at this, especially if the leaves are big. Um, and That's a good tip. If, if not, then you kind of have to sometimes sacrifice and say, okay, if this leaf is just too far gone, it's better to just cut it off to get rid of you know, the insects, but all the potential eggs that are on that leaf. And in the case of the Monstera in my kitchen, you said that that one is just RIP at this point. Yeah, because what happens is once let's say every single leaf has an infestation, like no amount of cleaning would, would ever totally get rid of them and you're just kind of going insane trying to clean it. So we're gonna get rid of that one and then we would have to sanitize the container before we use it again and the trellis that it's on? That's right, so what happens with pests is that not only are they on the plant, but some pe pests in particular also just crawl around the outsides of your pot and all like accessories around the pot. So one thing that I suggested to you is that you can take the pot and the trellis and just put it outside in, in the sun and right now it's in the winter so the cold and the sun will kind of fry up those guys. Lovely, <laughs> love the sound of that. Daryl, we've been on a lot of plant adventures before. We divided my calathea, we've repotted some of my plants, you've provided exceptional tutelage on managing my big bird upstairs and one of the things that you have taught me is that a yellowing or a browning leaf is part of the circle of life. This, okay, I'm not gonna do it. But yeah, tell us, tell us why we shouldn't be panicking about yellow and brown leaves and what we should do about them. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of common plant advice would say things like, oh, the leaves will tell you if something's wrong. If, if it's yellow, maybe you're overwatering. If it's brown tips, maybe you need to raise your humidity. But I've come to see that no matter how careful you are with watering, no matter how much humidity you may have, leaves don't actually last forever. They, they have to die out at some point. So realizing that, then I think it's healthier to give your plant good conditions so it continues to make new leaves even as the older ones die off. So as you can see from this Monstera here, that all the leaves that are yellowing, mm -hmm. they are the... Oh. They are the oldest leaves on this vine. So, yeah. you know, vines grow, they keep getting new ones out of the front, but then at the back, you'll have the older leaves. And this leaf has probably been on the plant for maybe a year or two. So do I just pull this off? Yeah, so what happens is for some plants, once they turn yellow, then they're pretty easily just taken off like this. Whereas you couldn't take off this leaf very easily, right? right? So even just now, I pulled off the leaf and this part of the plant already looks better. And what about something like this, where there's a little bit of browning on the tip? Am I, pan do, am I a bad person? Yeah, so, no, or sorry, no, you're not a bad person. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what happens is uh, leaves are also the, uh, I guess you could say the filter for the plant. So anytime you, you water a plant, there's all different sorts of things in the water. And one of the things that causes uh, browning at the tips is mineral damage. Now, when I say damage, it might sound like you should try to avoid it, but the thing is, 
at some point or another, your tips will go brown, especially the older leaves. So there's really no need to, to panic about it. However, you can sort of prolong the pristineness of leaves by occasionally flushing your soil. So what that means is you water the plant really nice and thoroughly, you let it drain out, and then you water it again to, to flush out the potentially built up minerals. And that will sort of help to uh, keep the leaves nicer looking for longer. That's a really good point. So that's sort of like advanced planting, but I think that's really good to know. Like if we, and, and our plants are gonna change, they're sort of like people in that they age and they look different and they get saggy and they get wrinkles <laughs> and maybe they need some surgery every now and then. So yeah, like we're not expecting our plants to look the way they looked when they came out of the greenhouse and it's totally reasonable to expect your plant to sort of change over time. That's right, and, and so for a plant like this, you know, you have to look at the structure and realize, okay, this is a vining plant and there's multiple vines in here. And we know that after a few years, these vines will get much longer. And at some point, this top part will just become all bald because they're losing the older leaves, at which time it's time to like chop people. and propagate. Yeah, exactly. You could chop and propagate and root those guys and plant them back in the top. Hair transplant. <laughs> exactly. Daryl, when I first met you, I killed every plant in sight and I owe all of this thriving greenery to you because you taught Chad and I how to take care of our plants and I am eternally grateful for that. I have read your books, I have gone on your website, I use your tools and they have been extraordinarily helpful. So for anyone who loves plants, you can check out all of Daryl's stuff. We've got links for it down below. And I guess the real thing to know here is that anyone can learn how to take great care of plants and live in a home where they have plants that bring them a lot of joy. Uh, I think there's just, there's just some humps you have to get over and then once you're over them, you're in a good place. And that brings us to this week's comment question, which is... How many plants do you own? And what kind of plants do you own? And what is your biggest plant challenge? We were also talking about how many plants constitutes a crazy plant person. So let us know any and all thoughts in the comments down below. To see Daryl's first ever appearance here on the Clean My Space channel, you can visit this video right over here. It is a lot of fun and also very informative. And if you'd like to support the Clean My Space channel, of course you can do so by subscribing and by visiting makersclean.com, which is where we sell all of our premium cleaning tools and more. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.